Welcome back to Cameron Mills Radio. By the way, stop by North Lime Coffee and Donuts. And guess what I got, Hunter? Not a tea. Wow, I don't know then. Got a coffee. Wow. I needed a little extra punch today. Clearly. By the way, remember our friends down in Louisville on uh, 1080 KJK? Uh, you all will be getting your North Lime Coffee and Donuts, I want to say, in about 45 days. That's Something like specific. that. specific. Well, because last week it was 60 days, and granted, I know it's not been 14 since we did it, so I'm just kind of rounding up and rounding down. Okay, so it will be a month and a half to two months before Louisville, you get your North Lime Coffee and Donuts. Go check it out. Fantastic homemade donuts. You'll like it, trust me. Dana O'Neill, one of my favorite people in the world. Last time Dana was on, honestly, I think she was with um, another company, and that was ESPN Radio or ESPN the Magazine, Dana, I forget. And you were part of that large group of writers that was basically laid off. And I don't want to, I don't want to look, I don't want to pull a Band-Aid off an old wound, but <laughs> I, I do want to talk about like what that was like for you. Because I remember sending you a text, and yeah. I didn't expect to hear from you because I knew you were getting inundated with texts from people who love you and care about you and just were feeling for you. But what was going through your head? I mean, what happened that day? <laughs> you know, it's one of those days like you're kind of like, oh, that just happened, really? I mean, we everyone had been hearing for months that layoffs were coming. And I, I said, I joked, it was like, Paul Revere, the layoffs are coming, the layoffs are coming. Right. Nobody knew exactly who was going to get caught up in it. And then we got an email that morning from John, Sk- John Skipper basically just Skipper. sort of saying, you know, nice platitudes. And like, all right, today's the day. Oh. So eventually, my phone rang with an eight six zero area code, and that was the day. <laughs> did you know? Um, did you I, know? Like no. uh, you, you heard they were coming. Like you, you knew they were coming, but you didn't know you were part of it. And then you saw that eight six zero, and you thought, "This is it." Yeah, I mean, I had had some gallows humors with some friend of mine. Like maybe it'll be me, and they're like, "Oh my god, no! Why would it be you?" And I was like, "Well, why would it be anybody?" Right. I, don't, I don't think. <laughs> how do you figure that out? So no, I absolutely did not know it was coming. Um, and so yeah, I saw the. The area code, and that was basically an editor with an HR person on the line kind of oh. laying out the lay of the land for us. And blindsided and, you know, devastated. I've, I've never had that happen in my career. Golly. I've never been let go anyplace. I've always been able to kind of move along at my own pace happily. And, yep. um, yeah, so it was it was brutal. Um, but I will say people like yourself and others who reached out to me sort of, it helped. I mean, yeah. I know it sounds yeah. like it sounds trite, but that stuff really does make a difference to let people know that, hey, I'm cared about, and I have good friends in this business, and apparently, I I mean, what really struck me was coaches. I heard from, I can't, I forget, I lost count how many head coaches, assistant coaches, which made me think, all right, well, my whole goal in this business is to do things right, so I guess I did. Um, And and Dana, the thing thing is about that, this is what's interesting to me about that, receiving so many platitudes, I guess that may may or may not be the wrong word, you're the the writer, but people reaching out to you um, that are coaches, look, part of your job is to be critical of coaches, so- And, that, and you have done that. I mean, that is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be critical of college basketball. You're supposed to be critical of the people that make up college basketball. So for those same people, did you get any texts from anybody that you had been maybe a little too critical of? Fairly, maybe. But, like, you know what? You basically gave it to this person, and they still reached out to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I there are, you know, obviously you have better relationships with some people than others. We're all human at some level. Right. So there are some people, okay, yeah. Did I know I'd hear from Jay Wright? Yeah, I knew I'd hear from Jay Wright. <laughs> well, you know right, I mean? yeah. Um, but, yeah, there were other coaches, that, you know, who I didn't even know. It's not even that I was necessarily that critical, but I couldn't say that I didn't. I knew them that well, people that I hadn't talked to in a quite a long time. Yeah, and so that made me feel good because at the end of the day, you're right, we are supposed to be critical and yeah. impartial or and all of that, but my goal had always been to at least be professional. Yes. So if I did take a shot, people understood that, I was just doing my job. I wasn't just sitting back pontificating. Right. And that made me feel good. Now, that, of course, doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> like, That's true. You know, it doesn't – I, I was scared. I was scared to death. But, you know, am I going to get a job? Because my whole thing is, has been always – I really love my job. I love what I do. Yeah. I didn't want to not do it anymore. And so that was the scary part. It was just – and lovely people said all the wonderful things you're supposed to say. Like, you're going to be fine. You're going to get a job. You're going to be – Scooped up, and I'm like, have you have you looked at journalism lately? Like, who's scooping me up? There's, what newspaper is no going to hire me? There's no newspapers. Right. Exactly. There's no place to go. So that was the scary part. It was like, wow, you know, it's not just that I was let go, but geez, right. please, nobody's. There's nothing else to go to. Okay, but you found it something else. Fun. You found something else to go to. So tell us about. Is it theathletic.com? Yep. T- theathletic.com. So I always say like this: theathletic.com is like the big company. We are the field house, which is the college basketball arm okay. of the athletic.com. It's myself, Seth Davis, C.L. Brown, Brian Hamilton, and Sam Bassini are essentially the full-time folks there. Um, and, yeah, I talked to uh, Alex Mather is the name of one of the co-founders, and I've jokingly called him, like, my journalistic godfather because I hung out, or fairy godfather, 
you know, he, everything he laid out made so much sense. I was so excited to what he told me about, but of course, you know, I was afraid to get my hopes up, but it, it's a, it's a different model. I mean, well, I've told everybody, I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm glad to try something different. Let's talk about the model because my understanding is there is no ad revenue. As far as I know, mm-hmm. there's no commercials, there's no advertising on the website. So how does it work? Right, exactly. So no advertising, no pop-up videos, none of that stuff. It's all subscription-based. Okay. To me, I liken it to like the old days when you got your newspaper, right? You subscribed to the newspaper, the newspaper showed up to your driveway, and you read it, and that was how you got your news. Or it's Sports Illustrated. Right, exactly. Exactly. This is the same model. It's just that the news is coming on your computer or on your phone, but it's total subscription-based. There is no advertising. There is no pop-up advertising. So. We don't need to do clickbait. We don't need you to yep. click on my story 5,000 times to make money. We are The the thing that I like about it, because I've argued this for years, and I felt like I was shouting in the wind. <laughs> I always have a chicken or the egg question. Are people yeah. going with clickbait because that's what they want, or are they going with it because that's all we give them? I tend to believe I have faith, faith in readers. I think people still want to read good content if we give it to them, yeah. and our goal is to give people good content. All right, so. Well- We'll test. <laughs> Let, let's start with good content because your first article that I know of, at least the first one that hit here home in Kentucky, uh, was uh, was Higgins' lawsuit against KSR. So tell us like how that happened for you, how that came to you, and then what you know about it. Because I know everyone here has read it. Garrett's been in here as a sure. prospective law student uh, trying to decipher it to me. He's dead wrong about everything he says. Uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, tell me what's going on with that lawsuit or what you can right, tell so, me. I mean, yeah, well, I, can, I, can, I, I can tell you that I, you know, I can't say that it was – I just sort of tripped in the, into the story because I was thinking of different stories to tell, and I thought, well, let me just – I'll call John Higgins, and just maybe I'll do a big, broad thing on you know, referees and what they go through and yeah. all of that nonsense. And he told me that he was getting in the process of filing a lawsuit. So I was like, oh, okay, okay <laughs> I can write about that. So I, I had no idea when it was going to drop. And yeah. Again, dumb luck, it dropped the second day that we were in existence. Wow. So, you know, basically his argument is – and if you, if you read the lawsuit, you'll understand – he is not looking to profit off of this. He's looking for seventy-five thousand dollars in damages. He's yeah. not looking to. He. I, this is a principled lawsuit in his mind, anyway. Yeah. Like he thinks this is on principle. His argument is that that Kentucky Sports Radio allowed uh, people to put comments on that had videos that put up his home phone number, that put up his uh, company's number, and that sort of egged people on. In other words, yeah. so. They would argue and say things like, hey, we don't condone this, but let's read some of the funny content. Right. Or let's go on the radio. We don't think this is great, but this is the name of the company, and they've expelled yeah. it out. Do I know if it has a legal merit? No. I am, I am, no, I am a sports writer. I have no idea. But, um, you know, I do know he went through a lot. And yeah. I do have spoken to other officials who said that, it, in their estimation, it was not normal. It was not business as usual. Right. That it was completely malicious. Um, you know, I don't know if, if they should be at fault. Again, I'm not. I'm not passing yeah. judgment. I this is this is the news. Yeah. He, he's filed this you. lawsuit, basically saying that by putting his prof- his personal information out there, they were culpable in sort of giving that information to people who might not otherwise have it, and they took up the torch and went crazy. Well, my only problem with the whole thing is, and I'm like you, I don't know if it's a legitimate lawsuit or not. It's the death threats that bother me. Everything else, yes. you know, intentionally lowering his Google score of his business, I don't like that. Uh, that should be separate from what he does on the court. The death threats is what bothers me because that affects his family, his wife, mm-hmm. his kids. I mean, that's scary, scary stuff. Because as someone pointed out to me, he said, this isn't ISIS. I'm like, how do you know? How do you know who's on the other end of that line that's calling in and threatening your life? So that's what bothers me. But l- let's talk about this because you've been someone that has carried and watched college basketball for years. You've watched college sports for years. Where do you draw the line? I mean, it's one thing to yell at a ref at a game. Sure. It's one thing to call him names. It's one thing to use bad language. Not that that's right, but where do you draw the line and how far is too far when it comes to giving? Because I had one friend this week who said, look, these officials know what they're in for. They know what comes with the territory. But I'm sitting there like, I don't think this part, specifically the death threats and the lowering of this guy's day job's Google score comes with the territory. So where do you kind of draw your line on that? What's fair? What's not fair? I think the, the line is very simple. I think the line should be drawn at the door to the arena. Yeah. You know, you want to get in your seat and you want to screech and holler and yell at your neighbor because your friend's there and, and say what you want to say. I guess that's your business as a paying customer. Yeah. When the game is over and he walks off the court, he should be able to resume his life and you should be able to resume yours. Because yeah. Honestly, at the end of the day, it is a sporting event. It is not the end of the world. 
you know, it, we're all going to survive here in advance. I mean, whatever you might believe about officials. And look, I'm a fan at some level, too. I've, sure. I've screamed, that's pass interference. You know, I've done the same <laughs> thing. I'm not saying I have Not from the press box you has. haven't. Not in the press box. That's right. I'm not. But as a fan <laughs> sitting in my, my couch, of course, or, yeah. or at a, as a fan in a stand. But, you know, I, I think that's what people have to understand. To take that extra step and to call someone's place of business, to yeah. call their home. He has children. Yes. You know, look, I, I'm on Twitter. I'm a woman on Twitter. Yeah. I have had my share of nasty. I yeah. can speak to the share of nasty, and I block and mute people on a daily basis. I mean, I truly do. And I just – I just – I mean, at the end, like, would, would you put yourself in their place? Yeah. How would you feel if that happened to you? Yeah. I mean, the guy's doing his job. It's a subjective job. He's never going to please everybody. Someone is going to be angry with an official every day. It's just the nature of the business. And they know that going in, and they accept that because they still love the game enough to feel like it's important to try to call it impartially. Yeah. They don't think when they go home – that their other lives should be touched. And, and understand that people don't understand. A lot of these guys have other lives. Right. Because unlike you, know, John Higgins has certainly walked his way up to the level of an official, or maybe he doesn't have to work. But at some point in his life, he wasn't making enough money to, yeah. to make a living. Well, that's what, that's what people don't get. And a lot of this, too, Dana, is I, th- I think we forget because, look, I am brutal towards officials on Twitter. Sure. I am. I absolutely am. But I think one of the things I've forgotten, and I for, and I realized this when my cousin, who was a girls high school basketball coach here in the state of Kentucky, lost his job, his daughter stopped playing, his love of the game is what brought him to yeah. officiating. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, you like the game. I thought you hated it because of the way you called it, because you call it the way you, as someone who would hate the game. But no, these people actually do this because they love being a part of basketball. And that's something that's lost on me a lot. I forget that. They do. I mean, they're, look at look at the time they're doing it. And understand, like, I talked to a younger official who I didn't quote. He's out there, like, slipping his rear end to a JV high school basketball yeah. game to try to work his way up yes. the ranks because he just loved it. And he said to me, and he, this is interesting, he said, you know, as bad as this was for a college official, imagine being me where there is no security. Right. There is nobody escorting me off and on the court. You're at some stinking JV high school right. basketball game where you're just – it's like open season, right? Oh. And and yet he loves it enough to endure that and hopefully climb the ladder and, to become a college official. And climb the ladder. You have to keep it in the back of the mind. That's right. And climb the ladder is the key because that's what my cousin says because he's not only – listen, he's not doing JV games. He's doing 8 to 9 to 10 to 11 to 12-year-old right. games at the Kentucky Basketball Academy here in town doing AAU. He's working like eight games a day getting paid about $20 yeah. a game just to get his reps in to get kind of his Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours in to try to become right. the best official he could be. That's what he's doing. And you talk about no, you talk about no security. He's there's like one sheriff in there, like in the entire five full courts, just to make sure there's no craziness. He's walking out by himself. And some of these Absolutely. fans, some of these fans at these AAU games with these kids, they're more raucous than they are at Rupp Arena. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Oh, without question. That's what this guy told me. And, 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 the, and the continuation of that is just because you climb the ladder and then become John Higgins and have security should not negate the fact that you deserve the same, you know, care when yeah, you're in that's when right. you're working that's people right. it, he's working i mean and it's the same like look at some level it's us you know i you know i hate i can't every school i've ever written anything negatively about i hate i don't i really don't right. i hate i hated baylor and i hated syracuse and i hated what stop but they wrote a story i i, I don't i love basketball yeah. i don't hate anything well, listen dana you and i met because the 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 impression about you was that you hated kentucky basketball mm-hmm. you came into lexington one time and wrote one of the kindest pieces not just about <laughs> me but about the lore of kentucky basketball sure. and what it is and that's how you and i met and that's what i thought this girl doesn't hate kentucky basketball she loves basketball yeah exactly and i do exactly i mean are there times where any you know like when a when a program does something, you're like, oh, my goodness gracious. Right. And what we've gone through the last week obviously makes it yes. difficult to fall in love with basketball. Yes, but it does. at the end of the day, I love telling people's stories. I understand. And, look, the passion that Kentucky fans showed, and I, and I do understand, and I think it's important to stress, this is not – what happened with John Higgins is not – it's not normal to happen to an official, and it's not the normal fan reaction. That was one percent right. of one percent of people. That's right. And to cast everybody, Kentucky fans are crazy. No, yep. they're not. Some people are crazy in every fan base. Unfortunately, Kentucky fans have got painted with a broad brush, and yes, I think they that's do. really unfair. It's like your typical bad apple in the bunch here, right. spoiling it for everybody. But part of what makes my job fun 
is the passion. Part of that passion is occasionally they're going to hate me because I write something they don't like. I get it. I totally understand it. And I am free to have a happy disagreement and discourse with people. But when it gets personal and nasty, then it needs to Well, and that's the problem with Twitter I have and a lot of social media is because it can very easily, out of the anonymity of the person arguing with you, it can get personal and it's no longer, hey, let's talk about this, you know, in 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 a civil way. Very quickly, a lot of times on social media, it gets very uncivil. I got about one or two minutes here, Dana. Kind of just give us your thoughts and your feelings about what's going on in college basketball right now with the FBI investigation. And it's unfair to give you two minutes, but that's all I got to give you. (laughs) It's okay. I got you. I think, you know, look, people say it's the tip of the iceberg. I suppose it could be. My thing is, like, whether it's the tip of the iceberg or not, we've all known things have been going on for a long time. And I say, oh, I feel complicit in some of this because I've heard the same rumors. I'm sure you have. Yes, I have. Everybody has who's in in knee deep. So to me, the answer is now, okay, now that it's been exposed and the dirty curtain has been pulled down, what are you going to do about it? And I say you, I mean you and me and coaches and athletic directors and presidents. Everybody needs to get on board and say, we need to fix this. I think there are, you know, look, there are simple fixes if the NBA would agree with the one and done rule with the going the baseball model. I know Coach Calipari has proposed things like that. Yeah. They're very smart decisions, but everybody's got to get in the same room and agree because it can't just be college basketball. The NBA has to agree. But if this doesn't make people stop and say, we need to fix this and genuinely fix this, we're going to be right back here in five years. Yeah, and you know, one thing that Dick Gabriel, one of my colleagues said to me the other day, and I knew this, but I thought about it all over again, is that you and I are not only complicit we're making money off these college kids. Of course. I mean, you get to Absolutely. write columns about them. I'm sitting here having a radio show that, granted, is breaking even at the moment, but nonetheless, I, I have a <laughs> chance to make money off talking about college basketball, and that's not fair to these kids on some level. Something needs to be done. Absolutely. I mean, and that's the bottom line. If something needs to be fixed, we like I said, you know, there is so much wrong with the balance of power in so many of these situations. Yep. The reason this is going on is because these kids don't have control of their own destiny. That's so right. We need to figure out a way to empower them to have control of their destiny without completely sullying the model that we're accustomed to. There has to be some sort of a compromise on both sides where you can have some version of purity, but some sense of the players don't feel like they're being cheated out of what yes. they're owed. And, and people, like I said, there's just a lot of people, this is the part that stops me, that have to get in the same room to agree to that. And that's my fear. Can all those people agree? Dana O'Neill, she used to be with another entity. We won't even mention it now. She's now <laughs> with the athletic.com field house, right? Yes, sir. All right. And that's where we can find you. Where are you on Twitter? You're at Dana O'Neill Ryder? Yes, sir. All that's right. correct. I, I am now right. I'm not changing that because that's what I am. There you go. <laughs> Folks, follow Dana O'Neill. She is not a Kentucky hater. She is a Kentucky, She is a basketball lover. Therefore, she's part of Kentucky. Dana, love you. Appreciate you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Cameron.